Today's episode is sponsored by Future State Media, experts in off Amazon traffic for Amazon sellers. Future State Media will build you a custom made website to deliver sales for you on Amazon. Built to grab traffic from search engines and social media, your site can be used as a secret weapon for launching products on Amazon or just to stabilize your Amazon sales. It means you can also build an email list on autopilot. Go to futurestatemedia.com for your free guide to Google SEO for Amazon sellers today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the 10K Collective Podcast, the place to be for six, seven, and eight-figure Amazon sellers. I uh, was just talking with our guest today about the fact that actually there is a lot more to life outside of or immediately adjacent to the Amazon world. Um, Walker is uh, an amazing person. Walker Dybal of Quiet Light Brokerage uh, is the author of Buy Then Build. He's, his book is about how acquisition entrepreneurs outsmart the startup game uh, and a business broker at Quiet Light Brokerage. So, Walker, warm welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Michael, thanks so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to chat to somebody outside of the Amazon bubble. We were talking about that. And although you do deal a lot with uh, Amazon businesses, I know that you guys help businesses be bought and sold, many of which are FBA or Amazon businesses. But also you have a perspective that includes e-commerce, but also a lot outside it. I think that's really, really healthy to put these things in perspective. So uh, I know you've you've packed an extraordinary background. I was saying to you before the show that I was expecting some 70-year-old grizzled veteran based on your resume or your CV, but actually uh, you look very youthful and, and fit and yet you have packed in a million things. So tell us a little bit about what you've done in the last few decades. Well, I haven't slept a lot, Michael, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so it's, it's one of these where we could kind of come at it a few different directions. Um, Let's talk about it from uh, just on, on the sort of private markets side or, or market side. I, I, you know, I'm a cert, I was a certified, sorry, I was a registered um, um, uh, stockbroker with the Securities and Exchange Commission, certified M&A advisor. So I'm familiar very, very much with the private middle markets. Um, and obviously I work as a business broker. Um, as an acquisition entrepreneur, I've bought half a dozen companies uh, over the last uh, 12 years now, calendar just flipped. And I've also done a couple of startups. So, you know, I'm familiar and I've had a couple of exits myself. So I, I've personally been in every seat um, on a deal and really understand um, both entrepreneurship and buying and selling in the private markets. That's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to dig into, you know, the, the war stories from the stock exchange, or maybe I've just um, watched too many uh, of those, the movies. You know, I have to say that the guys in, in London work hard, play hard as well. It's probably quite a similar life, but keeping it real, we better keep it, keep it all about in you know, a business for now. Um, so that's a, a massive uh, resume, as I said, or CV. <laughs> so what brought you to um, ending up being in quite light brokerage is the first question. Wow, what a great question. I love this question too. Um, so it's one of these where I actually fell in love with Quiet Light pre-2010, right? So, um, you know, at the time, the first company that I bought was actually a very much offline book printing company. Um, and, you know, there's a whole story why that ended up. We'll skip that for now. But the thing is, is I, I was sort of charged with the mission of trying to figure out how to get this, you know, bricks and mortar entity um, online. Right. It was it was really the first kind of like Amazon move, but we didn't call it that. What we called it was like print is dead. Right. Like ebooks were coming up and uh, the Apple iPad launched and, ex and et cetera. And so the thing is, is I was trying to I had some very, very um, strategic business problems that I was trying to address. And so I was looking to um, uh, grow through acquisition at that time. And uh, so I became familiar with all the different ways that online businesses were being bought and sold. Um, but, you know, I was looking for a very specific thing. Um, I ended up going on a three and a half year growth through acquisition attempt, uh, looked at 27 different companies for real, like deeply, uh, but hundreds of, of companies, you know, um, um, just from, you know, listings. And it, Quite Light Brokerage really had the best prospectuses. And I, I'm telling you, I, Michael, I don't care if it's, you know, a publicly traded company, a, you know, a $50 million, you know, middle market M&A firm, you know, launching, um, or, you know, kind of a main street online or offline business, Quiet Light, I frankly believe it's because the entire team is made up of entrepreneurs that have done um, all of these things that, that they can really think deeply about a business and put together a perspective that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
So it's one of these where I was recruited to a private M&A firm along the way and I sort of turned it down. And one of the companies that I bought, the, the broker at the end said, boy, you, you really understand this. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> and, uh, and he actually decided that I was going to be his succession plan and, you know, made an attempt to sell me his whole brokerage. And, um, you know, I, I sort of passed and was like, you know, if I ever do this, I'm, I would only do it with Quietlight. Uh, ultimately, I did end up um, uh, buying a company from Quiet Light that I still own and manage today. And, um, you know, it just sort of came up organically. And, and one day I said to Mark Doust, you know, hey, you know, what do you think about uh, me potentially joining the team? And, and uh, it just, it, it just kind of happened from there. Amazing. That's, that's quite a story. I mean, I think, um, so prospectus is obviously a, a big thing. We'll have to dig into what, what that is and what's involved in that. So because obviously the world of buying companies is very, very new to me. I've talked to, it's funny how you can end up on very, like it, it reminds me of a sort of misshapen athlete that goes to the gym and does lots and lots of work on the biceps, but forgets to work on the triceps. And I've talked to so many people about how to sell an Amazon business, which when you're a startup owner is an obsession with many people. And then you forget about the, the fact that you could also buy them. I mean, so um, very well, interesting. I'll share with you, Michael, that I think that the, the, the most, most entrepreneurs, okay, first, okay, well, most entrepreneurs don't really think about it until immediately after they've sold. And what happens is, is I, I so often have the question about, you know, 30 to 90 days after someone is sold, which is, gosh, that, that startup period is so hard. I think I'd rather just buy something so I can start cash flowing immediately. And it's like, yeah, you, so, so what you see is, is it's a lot of the sellers that start to kind of have that light bulb moment. I guess you're, what you're saying is that the, this is essentially, I suppose, one of the reasons why one should think about starting with a, an existing business. That startup period so hard, I'd rather buy and cash flow immediately. I mean, that, it, yeah, it's almost, I have to say, there are many sort of artificial dis divisions that I knock around into in the sort of Amazon bubble, as, as Will Chernin calls it, who um, is a consultant rather than a, they, uh, a broker, but equally... Um, he has a healthy sort of skepticism of being obsessed with one area. And I think it's it's weird how there's almost a badge of honor that you should be two things. Number one, a raw startup. Number two, well, actually several things. Number two, only your own capital involved. God forbid that you should get an equity partner who actually can capitalize things properly or a bank loan. And number three, that it has to be physical products only. Like if you add a, a service wing to your business, you're somehow not genuine or something. And it's it's very weird how even though everyone's free to do what they want and that the freedom for entrepreneurs is allegedly very important and, and certainly independence of a very kind of day-to-day -day nature seems to be genuinely very important with the, the nature of the beast. But on the other hand, I do think people put weird rules on themselves. And it's, I think um, that, that I've got to create this from sweat and my own capital seems to be one of those rules. So... Tell me a bit more about that, that light bulb moment that people have when they've sold a business then. Let's start at the end. <laughs> well, like a very odd place to start. Well, no, but let, 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 let me turn it and start to the beginning, right? Okay. Well, it's, it, well because it's a cycle. So the, the very end is also the beginning, right? So it's sort of like, how do, I, how do I do the next thing, right? And the thing is, is you know, to, to your point, you've got a lot of different options. And I think that um, if you are truly going to build like a zero to one um, you know, type of startup. If you, if you know the phrase, it's Peter Thiel. Um, it's kind of like you're creating a whole new marketplace around something that doesn't exist, right? If you're doing that, then, you know, buying an existing business probably isn't going to be the right way. Like that's, that's a true venture capital kind of adolescent market sort of thing. But for most entrepreneurs, that's really not what they're trying to do. Most of us are really just trying to, to your point, gain autonomy, right? Create stuff, um, do cool things, put our skill sets to work, grow to financial independence, all of these types of things. And when you look at startups, there's, you know, there's a couple ways to, to do it. One is obviously going out and, you know, selling equity, um, selling, you know, giving away stock in your company in exchange for dollars so that you can get cash infused, right? Um, uh, if you buy a business, you can go get a loan. Well, let's slow down. What is the point of a startup? Okay. What is the purpose? I think it's this. I'm going to, the purpose of a startup is to build an infrastructure, okay? Build an infrastructure that generates revenue over and above the cost of that infrastructure. Once you have profitable money on the bottom, that's the moment you become uh, safe, right? <laughs> that's the moment where, where you can actually maintain what it is you're doing. And any moment before you have a positive number on the bottom line, you're in the startup phase. So if you think about 
you know, what is the success rates of startups? I mean, we all know that, you know, it's sort of, you know, one out of 10 makes it, right? I want to jump into some US-based numbers for a minute, okay? Michael, I know, I know you're in the UK, so bear with me. But it's one of these where, uh, you, you know, I learned from Vern Harnish's book, Scaling Up, that only 4% of companies in the United States ever exceed a million dollars in revenue. That's crazy to me. That's a really low bar that, that, you know, that basically says, okay, you know, you are an except you are an exceptional company if you hit seven figures in annual revenue. Right. And so the thing is, is that when you look at a business of that size and you consider that again in the United States, anyway, the small business administration is lending up to 90% of the transaction value of these businesses. You're talking about, um, you know, being able to buy one of the largest 4% of companies in the United States with an equity infusion, a down payment, uh, very, very close to that of the average down payment of a home in America, right? And so the thing is, is that when, you have a, when you're buying a home, you have to go to work and make money so you can pay the mortgage. When you buy a business, the income from the business pays the loan off. Right. And so the thing is, is it gets you immediately to sustainability so that you can go to work improving the business, you know, living the life you want, doing the things. And so you really fast forward and skip a lot of the, you know, build from scratch work. And since most of us are truly just trying to do an N plus one thing. And when I say N plus one, what I mean is like a better mousetrap, right? Like maybe we're going to make a, you know, we're going to take this existing product, add a little something and sell it on Amazon. You're not out there creating a whole new market. Okay, you're, you're just simply coming up with a new supplement, right? Or whatever your product is. And so um, uh, that's a perfect example. Wow, okay, there's, there's uh, some fantastic um, sort of mind check shifts going on here. So you were talking about uh, catching lightning in a bottle. This is more like sort of gears going clunk, clunk in my brain. So the first things to sort of reflect, um, I like this, this definition, you're aiming to build an infrastructure such that the output of the infrastructure is bigger than the cost. And I think it's it's very easy to forget that. I mean, because it's so much work that people are busy building Amazon businesses. And you can scale a business very fast on Amazon because they bring a lot of traffic and they bring a lot of conversions. So, so that brings you a lot of revenue. But the people really forget about the bit dropping out of the bottom part until they try to live on it and realize that the number isn't as big as they want. But also the fact that you're defining the startup phase not by sort of revenue numbers or something, but actually that by the profit or the lack thereof which is quite a different way of, of defining it and I, I think that's very healthy because in the end what's the purpose of the startup you know as you say it's for creativity autonomy financial independence and I think those aren't those aren't uh, values that necessarily align in my experience creativity can be so much fun you forget that you're supposed to be making money out of that's it right. it sounds like a crazy thing right but a lot of business owners aren't really driven they're driven by money but not necessarily by what's going in their pocket I, th I really think that, that people misunderstand this about them, the small business entrepreneur mentality. They're driven by the excitement generated by their business a lot of the time, I think. I mean, what's your experience with, you, you deal with so many business owners? You know, I, I think that, well, just being in the, being in, look, I, I think that the minute you can stop focusing on cash flow is the minute you actually hit success, right? Success, you could really define as, um, you know, the minute you can stop focusing on cash flow and start focusing on how many people you can help, right? So um, again, you need that sustainability. And the thing that, um, the thing is, is that, okay, so uh, are you familiar with uh, the book Moneyball? Michael Lewis, they made a movie called, um, no, no, the movie's called Moneyball, isn't it? Yeah, I've heard, heard of it. I'm not, I'm not, I know, by the way, Scaling right. Up, which is just an epic, epically good book. I recommend that yeah, to everyone. Right. But, but Moneyball of, is something I've heard of, but not read yet. So tell it, us, right, tell right, us about right. it. Right, right, right. It's not about cricket, is it, Michael? <laughs> but, I, uh... I find cricket really boring, I have to say. I'm very un-British. <laughs> I, I, I had to play it at school, so now I'm <laughs> I, But is Moneyball uh, related to baseball or softball yeah, or something? It, like that's it, that's it. And, and, okay. and the concept is, the, the concept is um, there's an analysis called sabermetrics, right? And and basically, you know, um, some geek, you know, figured out that, okay, if we actually focus on um, hit batters that can get on base, as opposed to batters that swing for the fences, right, batters that, you know, shoot a lot of home runs, then we can actually get those players for a lot less money. Um, and we found a, a hack into how to actually get uh, win at baseball. 
And the theory was adopted by the Boston Red Sox, uh, among a few other uh, teams, and ultimately won the World Series, right? They went all straight to the top. And it was basically saying, let's stop swinging for the fences and focus on getting on base, okay? The analogy- okay, so, so translate that into English, I guess, like swinging for the fences when you hit the boundary in, in, in cricket and, and then getting on base, is, is that a sort of minor yeah. achievement and you get a point for that or something? You know what? I, I've never had to explain this. Uh, it's really because Americans use baseball metaphors <laughs> the whole time. Like everybody in the world plays baseball. I'm like, dude, it's not really a thing here. No, you know? it's not <laughs> a thing. And if I if I base my business teaching on cricket metaphors, I'd be stuffed because no English people would know what I'm talking about. I guess it's sort of like um, it's it's it, I get, the analogy. This is a bit of a stretch, but it's sort of like rather than get that superstar you know, football player who can, you know, score a lot of goals, focus on the people that like, you know, can pass the ball without it ever getting stolen. Right. Kind of okay, thing. fine. So you it's, know, it's sort of minor on. wins, lots of minor wins, which actually cost so much less because the ability to do big, big hits and get a lot of stuff is actually very expensive ability. So that right. the relationship between the cost of it and the payoff is actually better if you get the sort of minor performers, but more of them. Is that roughly a summary? That's- that's about right. And I'm, okay. again, I'm sorry for taking us down that rabbit hole. Yeah, that's fine. Man. <laughs> it's kind of just got to understand what, what we're saying. Yeah, but, okay. But, and that's, that's all about Moneyball is all about that theory. That it's a sports book then essentially, is it? Yeah. It's, okay. it's focus, on, focus on just getting that first bit right yeah. and, and not going for that runaway I'm going public startup. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the analogy here. So the, so the point is, is that, you know, if you go out and, you know, basically acquire a business that's, you know, generating, let's just say a million dollars in, in annual revenue, a million pounds, if you prefer, um, then, you know, you're already at such an exceptional success rate compared to most companies out there, right? And it's something that is, you know, somewhat affordable. It comes with a margin of safety um, in that it's got historical performance, um, lower multiples than, you know, middle market companies, um, so on and so forth. And so the thing is, is that uh, by focusing on buying something small so that you're kind of off and running, uh, then provides a platform for you to do your entrepreneurial activities, right? Now it's time for you to innovate. Now it's time for you to expand the product uh, line. Now it's time for you to do this or that and grow from there. So in other words, this is a, a small business like this that, as you said, if it's lower multiples than the middle market, uh, it's a bit like the guys that don't cost so much money because they only hit singles or, or get to home base, which people say every five seconds. So I guess I've got to assume that it means kind of moderately good performance. I can't visualize it because I've never been to a baseball game. But yeah, and then as opposed to the really big hitters that are already doing worth several million dollars, they're rarer, therefore they tend to go for bigger multiples and, and the value is less as well. So that's, there's quite a lot of upsides to it. Yeah, that's part of it. But Michael, I think, okay. I think what, it more, what I'm more speaking to is actually just the success rate. Okay, so okay, okay. you look at startups, like someone, you know, like anyone goes out and starts a business, okay? They're going to, you know, they're going to put some capital infusion in it. They're going to put a lot of sweat. They're going to bleed. They're going to spend a couple of years trying to get it off the ground or whatever it takes, right? And that's what we do. Um, and the thing is, is that, um, you know, 90% of them fail. I mean, like they go to zero right? Zero. So when you look at, so the metric that I use is I look at businesses that have been acquired over the last three decades using loans from the small business administration. And the default rate has maintained at under 2% during that entire time. Okay. So if you define success as not failing, you've got a 98% success rate in buying an existing business that has historical performance. When you look at startups, about 10% of them make it and 96% of the ones that make it never exceed a million dollars in revenue. Now, look, you and I both know we can live off of that. You launch a product on Amazon. I mean, maybe I'm not hitting a million dollars in revenue. That's fine. But the truth is, is look at what's truly being accomplished and think about what your goals really are, right? So if you want to just start by making sure that you have one of the, one of the you know, more exceptional businesses, a very easy way to do it is to go out and buy an existing one. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's You're funny. You're right in the multiples, but I, but I yeah. also, but also from the success side. No, which is much more critical. Now, I was missing the main point, So, which is because it's... Um, I mean, I, yeah, what you're saying is, yeah, nine out of 10 will fail within the first, whatever, three years, the traditional metrics, let's assume that's about right. And then of those that remain, 
um, the, 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 the Vern Harnish metric is so 4% of those are going to be doing over a million dollars. So I guess you're in the sort of top um, sort of point. 0.4, no, 0.04, some ridiculously tiny percentage of businesses that actually A, survived and B, doing a million dollars or more in revenue, which as you say, you know, on Am if it's on Amazon, by the time you take on all the costs out, is more or less the beginnings of a living, but it's, it's not a particularly big one either. So it's, um, exactly yeah, right. it's a very, that's a very, very sobering statistic yeah, indeed, but also the 2% default rate is extraordinarily low. I mean, that sounds like it is almost like a bulletproof business model to buy a business, I guess. Um, I was going to ask you the question that I've got on my list of, of potential questions, why buy a business rather than build it? And I, I guess you probably already just answered that. It's just way safer by the sound of it, like by a factor of 20 or something ridiculous. I mean, Michael, it's one of these things that like, despite the, the, the necessity and the popularity of entrepreneurship, we really haven't engineered a better way to start. It just, it just It's sort of like that analogy of launching a rocket into space and how it uses like 98% of the fuel or whatever just to get out of orbit. Um, it's exactly the same. And it's like, you can just start by, you know, getting on a rocket that's already in orbit. <laughs> and to your point, it, it kind of reverses the equation, right? So 98% so success rate in SBA acquired businesses versus you know, 0.4% who actually start from scratch, then exceed a million, if that's our marker. Yeah, it's kind Moreover, of crazy. Can I say something else? I want to add something else. Please. I want, I want, if you look at it from an investment perspective, it's also extremely intriguing. Now, now forgive me because I'm, I'm, I'm very well versed in buying companies in the United States. Okay, so a lot of this will translate, but, it, but it's, it's got to go through a translator. Um, if you look at, um, I, I'm just going to give you a, a really quick example and I'm gonna use some real numbers and I'm gonna need a little bit of trust from you, okay? Because the thing is, is I've run the numbers and, and this is accurate, but at the same time, it's just, an, it's just a linear example. So I wanna pretend that we're gonna buy a business with $1.4 million in revenue, okay? Let's pretend it's making $210,000 in discretionary earnings, just call that earnings. We're gonna buy it for a 3X and we're gonna use an SBA loan and put down 10%. So we are going to invest $94,120. It's a lot of money, okay? It is. So we're gonna invest that amount. Uh, if, if, if that's not enough money for you, just add zeros to all the numbers that I just said. <laughs> if it's too much, subtract a zero, okay? But the point is, is that you're gonna hold that business for 10 years, you're gonna grow it at 10% every single year, and at the end, you're gonna sell it, you're gonna have uh, just shy of 600,000 in earnings, you're gonna have uh, just over 3.9 in revenue, and we're gonna sell that for $2.5 million. After principal and interest payments, the discretionary earnings over the 10 years that you owned it are $5.7 million with, with the exit cash in there. That's what you've actually made off of that $94,000 investment in 10 years. Now, the number one thing that we say in America if we're starting a business is, oh man, we're gonna 10X this sucker, right? Just going through this small example of buying a $1.4 million business and growing it 10% every year, we have 27 x this sucker, and that doesn't include the discretionary earnings over the 10-year period. Wow, oh, okay. So I guess the moral of the story that I'm getting here is get your hands on some deposit capital and go and get a, a small business uh, loan, which I don't <laughs> think is a thing in Britain. I don't think we have anything equivalent to that, but quite a few listeners will be in the States. Um, yeah. And I believe it attaches to U.S. individuals rather than U.S. companies. Is that right? Or That's is right. that yeah? So it's obviously right. going to be pretty challenging for for anyone who's uh, purely based in Britain. Although that doesn't mean you can't go and talk to an American and draw up some kind of agreement. I imagine, but. Okay, so that's quite humbling. So I'm, I, I hope I've captured some of those numbers. I mean, maybe you can send those over because we'll, we'll put them in the show notes, which, by the way, folks, are at 10kcollective.com. Um, we always put some notes because I feel particularly when it comes to numbers-based stuff, which is a lot of the important things in life, in business, um, it's good to be able to look at those. All right, so, uh, okay. Um, so then my point, my point yeah. here, Michael, is simply that, you know, it's a better way to make sure that you succeed right out of the gate and if you take it from a financial perspective, it's actually a tremendous investment. Like, I don't know where else you get these kinds of returns. And so when I look at acquisition entrepreneurship, I look at the intersection of entrepreneurship and investor. 
right? Okay, intersection of entrepreneurship and investment. Right, so you've, cre- you've coined this phrase acquisition entrepreneur. So um, first of all, we've got to define what, what does that mean? Um, and then the second thing is how do we become such a godlike creature that gets these extraordinary returns at, with very low risk? Because that's obviously normally there's a relationship between huge risk and huge returns that you seem to sort of broken the crack the code in that terrible internet marketing cliche that everyone uses every 10 seconds <laughs> so it does sound amazing so so how what is an acquisition entrepreneur and how do we become such a person yeah thanks i, I you know i i i believe i coined it but it, it also kind of came out of um harvard business school right around the same time so i'm not sure exactly who said it first or whatever but it's it's definitely being used especially in the there's about 10 schools that teach entrepreneurship through acquisition and um uh it's the number one like you know mba class at almost every single one of those schools so it's it's pretty much on trend i i, I want to pause though for for a minute michael and, and and highlight something about you said something in passing that it's low risk and i want to really talk about that um I don't, I actually don't think it is low risk at all. So, so I think that, you, I think that, um, I think that there's, there's two things going on. Um, number one is, uh, quantifiable and number one is, is qualitative. And, and the first one is, uh, 100% of ultra wealthy individuals own their own business. Okay. What it's like a hundred percent. All right. Um, there's about 40% of those that are, you know, professionals like doctors, lawyers, you know, dentists, whatever, um, CPAs. Uh, but then you've got 60% of people that, you know, I think we would, we would, you know, more call entrepreneurs in one way or another with a, with a, with a product company or something, something of that nature. Um, and so the, 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 but the other thing is, is that when you are an entrepreneur and you own a business, you are living the most engaged life possible. This sounds cheesy, but, and you know this, but it's like when you breathe, your company breathes. You know what I mean? When, when, you, when you wake up, your company becomes alert too. Like it, it's, it's, it's one and the same. And I think that um, part of the reason, if, I think this is a theory. I think that if we were to go into some of those SBA backed, you know, acquisitions and really start to peel back, like, hey, why are you succeeding? Part of it is going to be because some of the, a lot of like every one of those people have a personal guarantee on the business and there is no choice to walk away. Right. So things might be going terrible, you know, in some of those things. And if they were a startup with other people's money, maybe it's just time to walk away and shut it and say, Hey, it didn't work. Right. I've got no personal guarantee. I've got nothing. You know, once you actually buy a business and you've got a loan on it, it's just as hard as starting from scratch. It's just that you're starting from a platform. And so I don't want to make this seem like, in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book, Michael, is that, you know, I hang out with a lot of entrepreneurs and I think just one too many times I was at a cocktail party and someone said like, Hey, this is Walker. He buys and sells companies. And it was like, wait a minute, this is not like trading cards. This is really hard. (laughs) This is just as hard as everything else. It's just, it's, it's every other model of entrepreneurship. It's just that, you know, you are kind of saying, okay, number one, um, I'm starting with an exceptional amount of revenue. Number two, I'm starting with something that has tremendous odds at continuing to be sustainable because it's got historical earnings and product market fit. Um, and number three, I'm working just as hard as anyone else is to try to grow these things, right? Um, and you've got to make decisions and you've got to make you know, important and strategic decisions every day. You know, do, I, do, I, do I you know, you know, reallocate capital to launch this product? Do I reallocate capital to do some conversion rate optimization? Do I, you know, spend too much on paid ads? Do I, you know, go source another product and launch it? Do I buy another business? Do I grow through acquisition with the cash flow coming in? I mean, you know, or do I take a salary? I mean, a lot of this is literally you take a pound out or you invest a pound into, you know, a new product. And so, um, you know, it's the same exact, you know, questions and challenges and problems that every entrepreneur faces. It's just that only the successful startup entrepreneurs get to this point and have to make these kinds of changes, you know, these kinds of, face these kinds of challenges. Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember reading in a book which I, I don't particularly rate, but which uh, I probably shouldn't say that on air, should I? But it, it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, which I think has a lot of useful stuff in it mixed up with a certain degree of BS. I, by the way, if I ever wrote a book, it'd probably be the same. So I don't think I'm going to be any better. But one of the things it said something like you can have the problem of too little money or the problem of too much money. And 
flicking, you know, looking back on that question now, I suppose what it means is you've got to manage the situation of not enough money, scrappy startup, um, you know, bootstrapping everything, doing everything for free, working on a kitchen table versus too much money, meaning you've got a lot of capital allocation questions now, which could still break the company if you do it wrong. But in fact, it could go wrong quicker. But it's it, you, you now have the problem of allocating capital or people or resources. In other words, you have resources, but you've still got to decide how to deploy them. So, I, and I guess what you're saying is that most people don't get to that point, so they don't realize it's a problem, but it still is a real problem, something like that, um, which is a very inter interesting perspective. Whereas I guess if you buy a business, you'll launch straight into the question of, okay, we have cash flow. What do I do with that? So it's, it's, it's a good point. I think, I think all I'm speaking to here is that when you're running a startup, you know, it's like, Every day something comes up and smacks you in the face. That's a quote from Brad Feld, okay? And, and from this tremendous movie, that, never mind. Uh, but, the, but the point is, is that, um, you know, I mean, you've got to create something from nothing with like, you got to be re extremely resourceful to actually get that done. And when you go from starting something from scratch to like operating a going concern, something changes, right? It's, it's you're no longer managing through the startup phase. And, and so many people, um, uh, only the, I guess two things. One, only the successful entrepreneurs will go, will succeed at getting through the startup phase altogether. And then once you do the types of things that you're doing changes, right? So only the successful entrepreneurs truly become operators of successful businesses. Um, and those are different skill sets, um, uh, but they're very, very closely related. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, entrepreneurs are really good at starting things from scratch. And so, um, what happens, you know, a lot of times buyers will be ultra concerned about, well, why is this, why is this seller selling, right? And there's sort of two reasons to that. Uh, but one of them is that they sort of can't help themselves. They've, they've grown something to, uh, to value and they've started their next thing, right? I mean, we all have shiny object syndrome as entrepreneurs and we want to kind of like start our next thing. And so I think, I believe, that one of the main reasons why a lot of entrepreneurs want to actually sell their business is because they become really good at starting from scratch and building value. And the second that you've actually created a successful business, it's like, okay, sell it. It's part of the cycle and I'll go start the next thing. And I think that just points to the fact that, you know, they, they are kind of different skill sets. Okay. So would you say then for the majority of people who have, let, let's bring it into something more sort of concrete. Um, if people have um, the skills to build a business, they've got it to a certain point, um, are they the right kind of people that should be looking to buy a business? And if so, then how do they move into that? And let's assume that the, they don't have huge amounts of spare cash flow, that they have enough to make some decisions like this. Let me posit a, a sort of typical scenario that I see quite a lot. Let's say you've got a, a million dollar a year uh, revenue business and you manage to get 10% revenue, uh, sorry, profit out of it, which is not easy actually, but doable. Actually with a business that small, it's harder than with a slightly bigger one. So let's say you've got 100,000 in, in positive cash flow coming out of it and you're able to hold off on taking much of a salary out and therefore you're going to be allocating that capital to existing products, potentially new product lines. You're probably at that point looking at quite a lot of loans to be honest, but let's say you can get out a loan um, and you can acquire a small business and you can get an SBA loan. I mean, first of all, is that even a thing? Is, is that a realistic scenario in painting? And secondly, if so, what? how do you go about deciding to start acquiring a business or even part of a business rather than just getting another product line? There's a there's a ton to unpack in, in that example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I, let's I, unpack it a bit. Businesses are so specific, but, but, but I, think, I, think that, I think the thing is, is that all, all that I really kind of set out to do with Buy Then Build is say, listen, listen, entrepreneurial community, there is another way, right? There's another way to do this. And it's invisible to most people. And most entrepreneurs don't even consider it until after they've sold their first business. And then they're like, oh, geez, I'm not doing that part again, right? And so then they're like, well, here, I'll, you know, in the business example that you gave me, um, you know, I've got 100,000 in, um, in, in earnings. Let's just say, you know, we sell the business um, for a 3X. So now you've got $300,000. And then, you know, you turn around and take a fraction of that, say 50 to 100,000 and go buy a different business, right? Now, why would you buy a business? Well, we already talked about, you know, the equity buildup, the ROI, like all of those things that come from, you know, the financial, the financial uh, uh, rewards that come from investment like that. And so the thing is, is that 
if you start a business at zero and grow it to a million dollars and then sell it, the thing is, is that buyer that's buying it because of um, the appreciation in value that they can get with, by growing a business because of the equity buildup that is part of paying the debt down and because of um, the simple uh, cash on cash return every year, they actually end up getting the same exact or, it, or a very close parallel uh, in value that that startup entrepreneur got as well. It's just sort of step two. It's sort of phase two. So the thing is, is like, if you're good at starting, um, then start, keep starting. Uh, what I find is, is that people, most entrepreneurs seem to do it once or they do it twice and then ultimately they build. Now, check this out. Look at Jeff Bezos. The dude invented Amazon, right? He just bought Whole Foods. Why didn't he just start a grocery store? He could have. He had enough money, right? Why would you do that? <laughs> it's because number one, once you actually grow that first thing, you know, look, I mean, yes, he's got whatever, billions in, re in revenue, right? And Whole Foods has whatever in revenue, I don't even know. But the point is, is like, subtract zeros if you want, make it 1 million, all right? Once you build that first one, well, why wouldn't you just buy a second one? The, se the third business I bought was actually an add-on to a business I was running. And I went from, I, I used cash flow from the existing business as the down payment. I used a bank loan and I grew revenue 20% in a single day. And so as I grew organically from there, I already had a higher baseline, right? So growing through acquisition is, you know, acquisition entrepreneurship is like the accelerator to the growth that we're all trying to achieve. And so whether you decide to do that to get from one to two or from zero to one is kind of your choice. I just think that this is a, a very plausible model, um, especially to people that have the skill set to succeed in it. Okay. So, um, so bringing it sort of back down to sort of back to earth for, I guess, the average listener, I suppose it's aimed at six, seven, eight figure Amazon sellers. And I guess that figure is a revenue figure, meaning, you know, that you can't eat the revenue and you can't buy things with it. You've got to see what cash flow falls out of the bottom when somebody puts it the other day. It's, it's generally less than you want, but let's say 10% is an average number. 20% would be very, very good. 5% uh, is borderline. And I see numbers between, you know, five and, and uh, 20. I see zero sometimes, but uh, zero and 20%, should we say. So for somebody in that sort of range, um, and sorry to keep harking back on the same thing, but I'm trying to make sure it's, it's something actionable for the average listener is what what are the options for somebody in that situation is it realistic to actually not sell your business to keep your business and bolt on another business is there any sort of way that it's even possible with a um i'm trying to imagine a scenario for example if you have um an e-commerce business that is very focused on amazon and rather than building um some kind of uh, marketing stream that you acquire something in the same space let's say you sell shoes you know i know that amazon acquired zappos for example is that, is that even that's even how you say it um so let's say you've got shoes somebody's got a wonderful uh, blog that gets a million hits a year about shoes and you want to acquire this as a way of getting um showing yourself up against Amazon making advertising more expensive and it's another source of, of traffic. Is that a thing? Does that ever happen? Is that possible? Are you asking can so for uh, the average Amazon seller selling yeah. seven figures, can they go buy a business and grow through acquisition? That's yes, I guess that is a much better question. Yes, it's okay. exactly what I'm so, asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, look, I, number one, absolutely. Um, number two, because you're in the UK, I, I need to footnote that and say it's significantly easier for someone in the United States to do that right now. Sure. Yeah. Because the financing is so readily available. Um, mm. You know, we've got, we, we do have buyers in the UK. Um, we've got sellers in the UK. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's just not quite as favorable right now. Um, and as a result, um, you know, if out of, you know, let's see, all of my deals last year, you know, probably 90% of the deals that we run through Quiet Light just tend to be buyers and sellers from the US. Um, and that's not for any reason other than uh, the, the cash is so readily available right now. I mean, there's just so much cash, interest rates are low, and uh, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of fueling the market. So um, it's absolutely attainable. Um, but you were talking very specific numbers. So you were saying that they, so let's unpack this a little bit. You're saying someone is earning hundred thousand dollars in cash is that right yeah but then they're but then they're maybe not taking a the salary they're taking half of that and putting it back in the business 
So I've got about 50,000 I'm living on. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's not an untypical number. I guess by the time people have built the business to a million, as you say, only 4% of businesses ever, then they generally have, uh, are needing to work on it full time and, and need to take money out. Um, so let's take that as a scenario. I mean, we can always put the 50,000 back in if it, if it doesn't yield anything at all. And let's assume that it's a US based business because we do have US based business as well, just because sure, that's sure. the scenario okay. you're more familiar with. Let's, let's talk yeah. about that then. Okay, sure. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that if I were just to sort of like give a rule of thumb, um, I would say that uh, I'd like someone to have at least $100,000 to sort of allocate towards acquiring a business. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, but basically, it just says that, you know, you've got enough cash to kind of, you know, do something here. Um, you don't need to have that much. And, you know, the, obvi the obvious statement is that if you have more than that, it's easier, right? Um, but so the thing is, is that, you know, let's say I've got, you know, $50,000. Uh, you could probably buy a business if you have enough SBA loan. And it, a lot of this, Michael, is going to be your... Um, comfort with with debt as a vehicle right um and so the thing is is that you know if you've got some, if you've got fifty thousand dollars and you decide you're comfortable with maximizing the debt okay footnote be careful make sure you're buying something that you've got the right skill set to grow and run okay um but then you could buy something for about five hundred thousand dollars all right so Assuming, assuming that is selling for a 3x multiple, that's going to be about $166,000 in earnings. So you just took your business that you were earning, in your example, $100,000, and you turned it into $260,000, um, again, just in one day. Now, out of that one hundred and sixty-six, if you divide by two, that's going to give you a, about $83,000. That's going to be your principal and interest payments on the acquisition. Since we maximized uh, debt in this example, right? So that takes you to about 183,000 in free cash flow that you can sort of decide what to do, taking your 100 from the other one you already have, you're almost doubling it, and then you've got about you know, 83, 84,000 a year just in, in debt pay down, equity buildup, right? So I hope you've been taking notes, folks, because I haven't managed to capture all of those figures. But I think, yeah, I get the idea. I mean, so really what it sounds like a great deal more to, to a British listener, anyway, this one, is that uh, it sounds like a property buy-to-let property investment. I mean, the landscape's shifting here as well. But we've had a situation where since about the mid 1990s um and it's no coincidence that the house prices or property prices have shot up since then in the uk that they, they may be due for a massive correction by the way and i'm not a, a house price guru so i'm not going to talk any more about that but um one of the reasons is because people could put down i mean i personally put down about 15 percent deposit and had 85 percent loan to value um back in 2006 and just to show what a genius i am i bought just before the financial crash so don't follow my my house investing advice but um that was back in the day nowadays you could probably need to put down 20 25 percent but it feels quite analogous because obviously you can pay back the cash flow at a reasonable rate amortize over time and um, thus build equity, you know, gradually buy yourself back equity. Indeed, my wife and I are doing something similar with the property we just bought. So it doesn't feel unfamiliar. I guess the down payment needed, if you're talking about fifty or $100,000, is probably more than you'd need with, I mean, in London, that would not be untypical. But in, in the prov provincial part of, of uh, the UK, you maybe start with 10000 down and get a, lo a loan for forty or something. That is possible in some areas, although nothing close to where i live in london trust me but uh that so that sounds like a um that sounds to me like a, i can get my head around it by looking at it from that perspective and is that a is that comparable in any way is that a reasonable analogy it, obviously it's crude but is that is that comparable or is that really pushing us in the wrong direction no i think it's i, I it's not crude at all it's quite the opposite it's exactly spot on like mm -hmm. uh, like like uh, that's the exact model and so the thing is is what acquisition entrepreneurship does is really take that equity build up um you know uh, uh driver of a real estate business model straight into entrepreneurship which is crazy right i mean it sort of it sort of breaks that ground now i one of the things that i do want to address because of um uh you know, the things we're talking about with online is that, um, you know, with a physical asset, like a house, okay, you, 
you have a physical asset. So the thing is, is that um, there is a little bit more of a, um, uh, what would you say, margin of safety, a little bit more protection, because if you wait long enough, the real estate market will to always turn back around, right? Um, and so the thing is, is that with, when I'm, when I'm buying a business, and that's actually, footnote, that's the reason why I actually bought a printing company first, was because there was so much equipment that the bank was comfortable making a loan, even though the equipment um, was, number one, only worth the amount of earnings that it would generate, and number two, uh, the bank way overvalued what they thought it would go for, but that was actually why I bought a, a offline business, is because that's where I could actually get, um, get financing. But the thing is, is that you know, when, you, when I look at a business, I'll often look at Porter's Five Forces. And you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you read, he's out of Harvard, he wrote Competitive Strategy. He wrote the book on competitive strategy. But you know, the five forces are, what are they? They're you know, customer power, supplier power, um, um, and com um, um, new entrance, uh, competition, and forgive me, I'm on the spot. I can't think of it. So suppliers, did I say supplier power, supplier? Customer. So we've had customer power, supplier power, new entrance competition, and some other <laughs> mystery to, to be found only by <laughs> reading the book. <laughs> That's I fine. It's like you, you got to you got to go yeah, read the book. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'll find it. But the, the 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 point is, is that in online now there almost needs to be another force. Is my point, which is it needs to be marketplace power. Okay, so you know if I'm going to buy, say, a fulfilled by Amazon business, and let's just say that a hundred percent of that revenue is coming from Amazon. Okay. Well, there's, um, there's a threat of substitution, by the way, is the, is the other Porter force. Uh, so, so the point is, is marketplace power, which is, you know, in, in this example, Amazon has a, a large amount of power over the business that you're buying because you've got, you know, channel concentration. So it's not like, so when you're buying an offline business, they might call it like customer concentration. But this is like a whole marketplace, meaning you've got all of those other forces on, on that platform, but then you also have, what is Amazon going to do? You know, I mean, are they going to, you know, change, are they going to increase their, their fees? Are they going to change organic rankings? Are they going to have an algorithm change that takes your product off of page one? Uh, are they going to, you know, um, decide that they want to start charging um, $20 for no reason? on every paid ad, you know, I don't know, you know, it's just like, who knows what they're going to do. And so, um, there's this other element of risk, um, in, in businesses with, with, you know, channel concentration. However, I would also note that, you know, you can look at something on Amazon, you can look at something that's driven by Google, you can decide which one of those you're more comfortable with. But then what I would also say is, is that when you're selling on Amazon, to me, it's just a virtual, um, version of, I sell all of my product through Walmart or, you know, X retail, nationwide retail store, whatever that is. And so the thing is, is um, how much risk is there if you actually have shelf space at the largest, um, you know, store in the world? And um, that's where, you know, as a buyer, you need to, you know, be, be comfortable with it, with that kind of decision. Yeah, and I think what this does, again, uh, <laughs> not necessarily a, a very, lovely insight but this is just making me assess more and more that if you look at something from the outside without your kind of scrappy entrepreneur head on where it's a bit like being in a rugby match or, or you know for American football where you, you just get down you hit lots of people you get muddy you kind of most people are going to make it as entrepreneurs really enjoy that challenge and that's another thing I would say they enjoy getting hit and getting muddy virtually I'm not, I'm not talking literally but um but once you sort of calm down and you sit on the sidelines as an investor and you're watching the game, it suddenly becomes apparent to you how incredibly risky it is. Because I mean, if you are a rugby player or American football player, you might be earning, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a week right now if you're at the top of your game. I don't know how that the rugby players don't earn that much, by the way, but American football players probably do. But next week, if you've broken your neck, then you might be earning nothing, and that, that might be the end of your um, uh, your game. And in fact, I know Lewis Howes, for example, the, the entrepreneur sort of coach type person, was a football game player who who's who ended it that way now uh, it sounds a bit dramatic to compare amazon to that but i do know quite a few people who've had in one case somebody was doing half a million dollars a month um suddenly just turned off for three months by amazon.com um on the base of something his va did that allegedly broke one of their policies around you know reviews 
but extraordinarily easily done and huge consequences. And I, I think when you're thinking about buying a business, you're probably calmly assessing that risk in a way that as entrepreneurs, we try and blind ourselves to. So I think that channel concentration risk, given the nature of Amazon, I'm sure you're familiar with that, is is absolutely massive and i think it's something that we all bury our heads in the sand about i mean what what are your suggestions to de-risk that situation whether in fact i suppose whether you own a business or buying one um have you got any thoughts on that well i do i i'm going to take my answer a slightly different direction in that i would say that if you're going to buy it you know you could look at saying well i don't want to buy a business on amazon because that's too risky well, I would flip the question and say, then why would you start a business on Amazon? Because you're putting all your eggs in the same basket, right? So it's, it's yes. really not any different to me. Um, but, the, but the thing is... The, is yeah, they're, right? both, they're both risky. So I suppose I'm sort of begging you to give us an answer to this horrible yeah, question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's, here's, here's what I would say. Let me speak to the market, okay? Let, let, me, not, let me not tell you my, my subjective thought on it, which I just did. But, but um, it's, it's, it's this. Um, let's see. What, what year is it? 24 months ago. 24 months ago, buyers, you know, at quite like we sell all online businesses, right? And obviously, you know, right now there, there is a lot of FBA businesses um, for sale. There's a lot of supply and there's a lot of demand. Uh, but the thing is, is that 24 months ago, as recently as that, you know, buyers were saying, why would I buy an FBA business? Like I can just build one for cheaper, right? Or, you know, it's, it's um, uh, Amazon has too much power. You know, they would say all of these types of things. But today, and I watched it happen. I mean, I felt it and I watched it. And, and what, what's happened is that in that short amount of time today, Amazon has become a completely accepted channel of distribution for e-commerce from, from buyers of companies, okay? It's just accepted. 24 months ago, Google was a channel. Amazon is where you would build from scratch. Today, it's just equally a channel like anything else. Now, let's say that you are passionate about, I don't know, coffee, okay? And you have a coffee maker, I don't know. And um, this coffee maker, it, you just, you love that space and you want to get into it. And then you go and you look at it and you say, oh, wow, this is really, really crowded, right? Um, and you sort of find a business in the coffee space um, that, you know, has great organic rankings and tons of reviews and has, you know, historical performance of being able to buy profitable uh, customers off of the Amazon platform. Um, you know, now you can actually buy that business and then use it as the infrastructure to launch your new product, right? And so you're not exactly, you know, starting from scratch in that example, you're wedging yourself into a platform where you already have an existing brand. You already have customer reviews. Maybe, maybe the seller was, you know, dropping them a coupon. And so they happen to have an email list off of Amazon. That's valuable, right? And so now you're actually buying an infrastructure so that you can launch your special coffee maker um, to existing customers on a platform that already has a track record. It's very, very interesting you say this because I'm thinking about a very real life situation that I'm dealing with. And without revealing anything about any particular customers, I'm speaking with a business owner who's sold a few businesses, has quite a substantial capital to invest, um, probably at least $100,000 within the first couple of years or even the first year if needed. And I'm just thinking about the fact that um, all of the things you're saying about this coffee maker example are very classic Amazon tale, which is you look through the keywords and you do your niche research and you discover that this could have been a great market to invest in a couple of years ago but now that ship has sailed because there's somebody who's established and out of a you know a coffee maker little niche what name this niche whatever it is you see the pattern all the time there's maybe a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenue being made in this niche of which 50 60 000 is being done by one particular brand with maybe a few different listings as well just to spread the risk but they basically dominate and because of that they decide things like the basic price of the market and the sort of features that you need to at least position yourself against so it's like if i try to go into the coca-cola advert um kind of market i would need to become dr pepper or pepsi i would try and be everything that coke isn't because that's the only space left so so um i think that is a very common situation that i see now so that says to me that kind of getting into a vehicle that has that market share and that market awareness and that proven traction is um feels to me like um 
it makes absolute sense of where Amazon's at now. But my experience of Amazon, when I work with new clients, um, often scrappy entrepreneurs with not much money, the space to get into that market is is getting getting harder and harder now. Whereas the value of the market is getting bigger and bigger. So if you can climb into that value, as it were, get into the vehicle and drive away straight away, that makes a lot of sense if it's affordable to you. And and actually, I have an unusual situation where I have to talk to somebody soon who has quite a bit of money to spend doesn't have the expertise and is wanting to potentially hire me or, or some revenue share deal or whatever deal we end up striking and more and more i'm thinking i'm not i'm noting myself i'm not comfortable with advising them just to go purely into the private label thing because it is such a bucking bronc kind of risk and this feels like that might be an option for that person and i'm sure they're not the only person out there in that situation it's very very interesting to me how this opens up another possibility that's exactly it. And it, it, it. Whether it's coffee or any other niche, to your point, I often see there seems to be about, you know, three players mm. in any niche on Amazon, right? Yeah. And like if you're passionate about that, and that's the area you want to go into, you know, acquiring as a start is a great option. And, and what, you know, we keep talking about the Amazon risk and all the rest of it. It's there. You can't ignore it. But think about how Amazon makes money, too. I mean, you know, like, you know, I mean, I guess they could change their whole business model and that would be the risky part. But the thing is, is like, if you've got three players and other people are trying to launch into that space, they're simply making those three players stronger. They are. How is, how is that the case? Well, by making it more competitive, the, the ones that um, maintain the market share are the established brands. Yeah, that is true. But I mean, you mean new entrants coming in, don't they sort of take away from some of their revenue and some of the profitability of the existing players? Right. I guess what I'm saying is like, um, let's pretend that it's it's uh, wide open and no one's in the coffee niche, in the coffee maker niche, and then you launch a coffee maker. Great. That's awesome. Now there's two. Great. That's awesome. Now there's three. Great. Now there's 200. Well, there's still three that dominate, right? So in other words, there's a line around the block for people that want the first page. So the people that are on that first page and the ones that are performing in that space are more proven than any of the other uh, brands out there. So, you know, you could launch a new brand and sort of get in line with everyone else, or you could acquire one of the three that are performing that have all the market share um, and go from there. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. I, I think, um, yeah, this kind of really answers with fundamental issue that a lot of people find. They, they they take a classic private label course, they go and look for the opportunity, and then they discover that pretty much most of the juicy markets have got, as you said, That's two right. or three players in it that are dominating. That's it right. doesn't really make much difference in practical terms, whether it's a $10,000 a month market or a um, you know $5 million a month market, of which there are so many on Amazon. But except, I suppose, if you fly below the radar, you're less likely to have the, the Chinese factories um, you know, selling direct to Amazon and competing with you, um, which is a valid point. But that's that's very, very interesting that in a way, the way the market is going in my feeling of how hard it is to get traction now is pushing people towards an acquisition type model anyway. And, and I hadn't really articulated that as an, an option until you've had this conversation. And now I'm thinking, actually, that that probably is um, potentially a solution for this, which brings me very neatly to the question of, OK, if you're going to actually do this, what skills do you need? We've already talked about the sort of scrappy entrepreneur mentality. And I guess that I've already alluded rightly or wrongly. And let, let's talk about this first mindset maybe needed is uh, I've said that, you know, I've got the analogy of the American football or rugby, which I was forced to play in school. So I know about that. Certainly very muddy, aggressive game um, versus the person sitting on the side. Is that actually the right division? Is that artificial? I and mean, how does how does that work in terms of the sort of people that buy businesses versus the sort of people that that run them or create them from scratch. Amazing. Wow. And it, like, and I also, I also, like, sorry, amazing question, but I also think that, that, um, I mean, amazing FBA question. Anyway, if, um, <laughs> the thing is, is that I think that I don't know that the difference between people who start from scratch and the people that, that buy are all that different. I think it's just a matter of people that sort of know the model and people that don't. Right. But anyway, the point is, I think that most people get, uh, the whole thing wrong. Um, in other words, most buyers, about 90% of self-funded buyers, potential buyers, will never actually end up buying something, right? And there's a couple of reasons for that, I believe. And the thing is, is a lot of times people don't even know what they're looking for. And they go at it backwards. And the thing is, is that they'll look at businesses sort of like items on a menu. Um, if I look at a menu and I see, you know, a ham and cheese sandwich, and I order, the, you know, the only thing that's going to happen when I get that ham and cheese sandwich is I'm going to destroy it. That's it. 
<laughs> I don't have to think about, ready, what I bring to the table, okay? And I think that, you know, buyers really, when they're looking for a business, they need to understand that they are going to be the CEO of that company on day one. And so you really need to stop. And before you even start to look at businesses for sale, really understand what is it that you bring to the table? Um, and I love that you brought up mindset because that's actually the first thing that I look at in my, I've got a preparation funnel that I go through with buyers. And it's kind of the first thing is, you know, I, I sort of ask the question like, what does the empirical evidence suggest makes a successful entrepreneur? Okay. Who are these people? What do they look like? And decades of research and data and psychology has basically got it down to this sentence, an intelligent, driven individual committed to a good opportunity. I love this. Let's unpack it. Why intelligent? Intelligent because there is a correlation between IQ and success. There's nothing that we can do to uncorrelate that. It just happens, okay? <laughs> um, maybe EQ will win out in the long run, but we're not there yet. Um, uh, a driven and committed individual after a good opportunity. It's not a great opportunity. It's a good opportunity. What it is, it's someone who's committed to, to, um, to making that opportunity work, right? And so when you're committed, you're resourceful, you're thoughtful, you're gonna, you put in the sweat equity and you get it done, right? So having the mindset of, you know, I'm going to buy this business and I'm going to, and I'm committing to it and I'm gonna make it work, or I'm gonna start this business from scratch and I'm committed to it and I'm gonna make it work. It's that level of commitment that is the difference between the ones that make it and the ones that don't. Yeah, that that does tie in with the people. I've, I've worked with some very um, uh, plausible people. And I have to say, I look at a lot of the things that my clients do, good, bad, or indifferent, mostly bad. And I, I see myself and I look that I'm, I'm guilty of most of the major flaws that I could see out there, including drifting other than being committed. But I mean, the people that really start up, sometimes I have more capital than others for sure it helps and they are just relentless they, they have a lot of discipline about building a business is their job even though it doesn't make them any money yet it's still a job they right. still get up at five in the morning and do it and I'm not a five in the morning person I'm more like a midnight person but it's either the five to nine a.m or the nine to one you know nine p.m to one a.m you know slot when you've got a day job that you've got to do it on top of so that makes sense okay so so the personality and the mindset is similar to that of, of an entrepreneur so what sort of skills do you need that yeah. are different to an entrepreneur when you're buying a business because i guess i'm comfortable with helping people start a private label businesses every so often it takes off like crazy which is great to see a lot of the times they just fizzle into nothingness sometimes they just run out of money which is just incredibly common unsurprisingly but what what are the things we need to be um looking to bring to the table as business buyers or what skills do we need to have? So I want to say two things here, Michael. I think the first thing is, you know, the, the second step in my funnel is really trying to unpack um, the aptitude of the buyer, right? Like, like, again, what are these skill sets that they have and they bring to the table? Um, I kind of look at it as a spectrum between you know, a, a revenue generator and a profit maximizer. And I think that as a business owner, you do need to do both, especially if you're a solopreneur, right? It's basically like, how do I push revenue higher and how do I cut out expenses to, to maximize my profits and, and getting that gamble right? I mean, that's the whole trick of, of running a business. But I think that people have a natural tendency to live in one place or another along this spectrum, okay? And so having a clear understanding of where you are and what it is that you actually like want to do with your time um, is important. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, it's important because it gives you clarity, right? In terms of the target and the growth opportunity that a, that a company provides. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that, boy, the analogies in this podcast are just never ending. But the thing is, is I used to actually race bicycles, okay? Uh, like road bikes. And um, what I realized is that um, uh, men buy uh, bicycles um, equipped to the level of rider that they want to be. And women buy bicycles to uh, the level of, of um, skill and training and fitness that they are today, right? And, and the thing is, is, is um, I've seen this in, in a lot of different ways, um, especially just in being married, right? You know, and um, 
you know, right now I haven't ridden a bike in about 10 years, right? I, I won Missouri State in 2010 and had a baby 90 days later and haven't even been on a bike. And now I've got about, you know, $20,000 of carbon fiber hanging in my basement. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but the thing is, is, and my wife, of course, doesn't ride her bike either, but, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the, you know, $200, you know, thing from, from whatever. And, and the point is, is that I think that, um, you know, we are talking heavily about buying a business on Amazon or, you know, and I think that I, I'm, my guess is there's going to be two types of people, people that know Amazon and have it mastered. Okay. And people that just want to sort of live that, you know, four hour work week and kind of buy a business on Amazon and escape the nine to five and, you know, join the new rich. Right. Um, you, you get the reference, I'm sure. But the, the point is, is that it's okay, I think, to buy a business in an area where you want to grow that specific skill set. Because business is business is business. I truly believe that. I think I've been in, I, I can't count how many industries, a lot of different industries. And the things are, are you know, it, it's all about how you run a business and how you um, are going to make it work, right? And so the thing is, is there's certain skill sets, whether it be learning Amazon FBA or you know, learning, um, you know, whatever, metal fabrication, you know, the difference between MIG and TIG and how to run it. Like it's, they're all just sort of different skill sets and things that you need to learn. Um, whereas someone who's already mastered FBA and really can navigate through it, like they're looking at, you know, the, the matrix or something and they know how to do it. Um, different growth opportunities or profit maximizing opportunities are going to be available to that person right? Because they're going to be able to look at a business um, and really be able to see with clarity the things that are underutilized that a seller isn't even thinking about, right? And um, so I think that the more advanced you are in certain skill sets, the more opportunities that you will see when you're buying. But, um, but both opportunities exist. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that. that there's a lot of clarity that comes in you know, okay, it's a spectrum and it's, you know, people are going to fall somewhere there, not going to be that extreme, but the idea of revenue generator versus profit maximizer. I think um, when you're in raw startup phase or you're, you're with people who are in early st stages and they've got, maybe they've got some profit, but then that therefore by your definition, not technically startup, but very early days. Um, I do think there is a big difference and they get muddled together, but the, the, the truth is a lot of people that end up doing, um, service type things or agency type offers are often quite good at maximizing somebody else's sort of rather raw uh, business because those people have got their heads they, those guys are like the prop forwards in rugby and i have no idea what this i'm going to repay the compliment that americans mystify brits all the time with sports analogies and they have no clue what it is but <laughs> i have no idea what the the biggest guy on an american football team is but the the biggest guys in rugby are prop forwards i'm probably excluding women as well this is probably a bad metaphor but the point is the biggest guys you know have a certain skill at just getting down and being willing to get hit and they like getting hit whereas the little guys um called a, a fly half i think they, they just grab the ball and run like crazy with it and pass it off to the guys the wingers who are good at running fast so that even in that sort of very physical manly game where as you say people <laughs> the male ego kicks in which always distorts the world greatly um there are different types of people and i, I really think for example that i'm more on the optimizing side than than the revenue growth side because there is a certain blunt force needed for the revenue growth side and a lot of those guys you know when you you examine the books and you gently point out all the flaws will quietly cry in the corner before realizing that their business is not making them any profit even though they're working 70 hour weeks and that's when the different mentality and the different types of personalities kicks in so that's that's super um insightful i think that one so listen there's just a ton that goes into this stuff i mean um I'm not sure how much longer we can keep you here without forcing you to write another entire new book. But what would you say are, are the, <laughs> the sort of practical steps that you would take if you are a, a person that is wanting to buy a, an Amazon business or an Amazon seller? You, uh, you've got the aptitudes. What are the sort of skills that you're going to need to bring to the party, either yourself or hire somebody in or, or find somebody else? Well, I guess what I would say is, is, um, you know, if you've got interest in this, I mean, you know, I, I've got, I've got some free resources on, on buy then build.com that can, you know, help people sort of, um, um, I've got, you know, I, I think I've got an acquisition calculator on there. I've got some free videos, tons of resources, but the, the thing is, is that, you know, you can get smart about it and sort of start understanding the model better. But then the thing is, is at the end of the day, what you need is deal flow, right? 
And you know, as a, as a buyer for over ten years, I and and now a, a, a advisor at Quiet Light, I obviously can't recommend Quiet Light enough. I think that you know, um, I guess I say we now we are we do an exceptional job. Um, and I'm when I I want to say they is what I want to say. My the team at Quiet Light just does an exceptional job, and I'm so blessed to to be a part of it. Um, we obviously have worthy competitors out there as well. You know, I mean, we, we, we don't get all the listings and, and that's as it should be. Um, uh, and, and, but the thing is, is that I think that you can, it's really easy to get bad deal flow and it's really hard to get good deal flow. And the fastest way for an online entrepreneur or someone considering an acquisition, in my opinion, is simply to go to quietlightbrokerage.com and, you know, put yourself in as a, as a get on the buyer list. And what you can do is you can just start looking at deals, you know, um, you can start watching, you know, how fast or how slow they move, you know. And so, um, you know, I kind of when, part of the way that I learned was just by watching deals, almost like like flashcards, you know, when you're, when you're in elementary school. And it's kind of like, OK, what do I think about this business and kind of come up with your own ideas about it and then just kind of, you know. Um, don't waste anyone's time. I mean, you know, if you if you don't have real interest, like you know, you need to be old, very very careful. But you know, the thing is, is like you know, as long as you've got real interest and you're willing to sign, you know, a non compete and confidentiality agreement, the you know, getting deal flow is readily available to you. And so you can start looking at deals, coming up with your own ideas, and then just kind of watching the market. And so it's like, you know, you'll get that feeling one too many times where you're like, ah, I knew that was a good one. And like it sold in 48 hours or whatever, you know, and, and, and it just sort of like gives you confidence in your own ability to kind of see these things. And um, I think that's, a, that's, that's probably the, the, the number one thing I would do. That sounds like a fascinating um, sort of educational um, um, situation where you just kind of watch what's going on and learn from, you know, making your own. It's a bit like paper investment, isn't it? As I said, the stock market training thing that you bait, you build a paper portfolio and you compare it to the actual stock market movements over time to see to gain some confidence before you start putting your own money down. So that, that sounds really good. It makes a lot of sense. So um, just a couple of resources just to reiterate free resources, buy then build dot com. Um, lots of things it sounds like you've got video training and and business valuation and uh, lots of things there and um yeah and i guess quite like brokerage we just had mark doust on from quite like brokerage as well who we were, we were talking about how to uh, sell a business which is much more of a focus for the majority of serious entrepreneurs that i know and, and many people who've sold them but really eye-opening i mean it's going to be quite an interesting um, thing for Brits to try and figure out some equivalent to the SBA loans and doubtless it's going to be challenging um, but hey we're, res we're resourceful people as entrepreneurs we'll figure out a way if there's a way to do it and and I think apart from anything else considering other options in life I always think is incredibly healthy because what it does is causes you to look at maybe the same exact thing you were ever going to do which is building a business but from a completely different perspective which is very very healthy so mark it's been absolutely fascinating oh, mark i'm going crazy now Walt right. walker I love mark. I, I, <laughs> mark is a great guy but it's because i mentioned him and quite like brokerage walker um it's been uh, really fascinating to talk to you and, and you bring obviously just huge amounts of perspective from as you said you've sat in every seat on the table and and that very much shows in your broad thinking i'm i'm definitely going to buy the book uh, i think it sounds fascinating set of topics um in the end as well one thing you've said that really strikes with me is sticks with me is business is business is business which again i think is such a healthy thing for people in the amazon bubble to remember like just because it's amazon like five years ago ten years ago you know the, the four hour work week was all about google and some kind of quick and dirty site right in 15 years time it might be completely different it might be different in five years but the basic skill sets and mindsets are going to stick around and that's the evergreen stuff that i always love to, to grab hold of so it's been absolutely fantastic any sort of parting words for people who are considering this kind of business model um wow i think i would just say um be patient be smart be cautious and the opportunity for uh you know what no i want to say one other thing i want to say one other thing that we are okay i believe that acquisition entrepreneurship will actually be the single greatest opportunity of our lifetime. And there's, there's a few reasons for that. Number one, well, it's a confluence of three things. Number one, you have uh, baby boomers who own more companies than any other generation in history. And they are retiring at the rate of 10,000 per day. And that rate is actually increasing over the next three years. And then it's gonna maintain 
through the bulk of the next decade. There's an estimated $10 trillion in business value that needs to change hands, okay? Number two, the proliferation of online marketing, online marketplaces, and online skill sets is something that did not exist during the product market fit of those boomer companies, boomer owned companies. And so I believe that there's a huge opportunity for people to take, um, you know, even Amazon FBA skill sets and apply them to this amazing and expansive infrastructure of businesses that's going to come up for sale. And thirdly, uh, you know, we continue to see huge amounts of capital. I mean, private equity is up to $1.2 trillion in liquid cash looking to be, you know, put to use. We've, we continue to have low interest rates and we continue to see, um, you know, banks lending at, you know, record rates. So the thing is, is that the confluence of these three things coming together and the fact that we can look ahead and understand that, yes, economic, Michael's change, economic cycles, you know, cycle, uh, but the fact is you still have $10 trillion in business value that needs a new home. So there's a tremendous amount of supply, and I'm really excited to see how the private market is going to be able to, 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 to manage uh, the, the, the transition of all of this, you know, basically the economic engine <laughs> so that, that's all i would say <laughs> wow all you would say is like just a huge big picture thing but fascinating i love macroeconomics i'm, I'm a big fan of reading things like the economist is about the only way i get the news now and, and i love that big picture thinking because if you're behind a just a whopping trend like any sort of demographic trends you know th there's no messing with that i mean aging is a thing it happens people will retire the, the 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 birth rate 50 years ago can't or 70 whatever it is cannot be changed so those are huge reliable drivers i love the fact that you're tapping into those things and those are incredible numbers so in other words a lot of wealth's going to be changing hands and i guess if you can be the handmaid into that either adding value or or helping in some way with that value proposition then then you get to be part of that whopping trend so very exciting indeed i love it i really love it great walker it's been such a pleasure thank you so much for coming on it's really been amazing michael the pleasure is mine thanks so much thank you